Welcome back to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Cressy, and this is episode 183. Really excited for this guest uh, because he's a guy who's been on the podcast before and delivered some great value. He's actually our first ever two-time guest, um, basically really digging in deep on the fascial system, something that is a little bit uncharted territory at the time we talked about it in 2020. And he's got a new book out, so we're going to talk about some of the developments, uh, things he's learned talking to more and more professionals in the variety of facets of the industry. Um, just finished the book and actually thought it was outstanding and something that's a must read for every strength and conditioning coach and rehabilitation specialist bookshelf. So something that I think he'll be able to, to clarify a little bit more on this podcast. So we're in for a very good one. This episode is brought to you by AG1, the most comprehensive NSF certified for sport daily nutritional supplement I've ever tried. With so many stressors in life, it can be difficult to maintain effective nutritional habits and give our bodies the nutrients they need to thrive. As a father of three young kids and a co-founder of multiple businesses in multiple states on top of still being an avid exerciser, I know that busy schedules can really take their toll on us. Whether it's poor sleep, exercise or life stressors, environmental factors, or simply not eating enough of the right foods, we can often wind up deficient nutritionally. This is where AG1 can really help. It's a game-changing nutritional insurance policy. They simplify the logistics of getting optimal nutrition on a daily basis by giving you just one thing with all the best things. That's why I use it daily, as do several of my family members, and we recommend it to a lot of our top athletes. One scoop of AG1 contains 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients that work together to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet to support energy, focus, digestion, and recovery. And this can all happen for less than $3 per day and without taking multiple products. Most nutritional supplements come to market and stay stagnant. AG1 continues to obsessively improve this one holistic formula based on the latest research, producing over 50 improvements in the last decade alone. They invest in the most absorbable and natural source of each ingredient and go above and beyond in third-party testing to ensure their customers continue to receive the highest quality and best tasting nutrition habit on the planet. Whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, it'll work for you, and it contains less than one gram of sugar per serving. They put 75 ingredients through the rigorous NSF certification test to come up with a safe formula that's trusted by some of the world's top athletes, including many of our own at Cressy Sports Performance. Right now, AG1 is giving our listeners a special offer of 10 free travel packets with their first purchase. Just head to drinkag1.com backslash Cressy and claim this special offer. These travel packets are perfect for supporting your immune system, energy, and gut health while you're traveling for games, training, or simply on the go. They can be great counterbalance to the less than ideal on the road food options that are out there for a lot of our traveling baseball players. So if you want to bridge the gap between deficient and optimal and give yourself the best chance of getting nutrient diversity, head to drinkag1.com backslash Cressy to get 10 free travel packets with your first purchase. Again, that's drinkag1.com backslash Cressy, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y. You won't regret it. Today's guest attended Iona College and was a multiple-time NCAA Division I All-American in track and field. He also competed at the 1988 U.S. Olympic Trials in the javelin throw. While he graduated with a degree in finance, his quest to improve his own performance led him to the strength and conditioning field. He attended the University of Florida and served as a graduate assistant strength and conditioning coach to the Gators track and field and football teams. He eventually moved back home and founded Parisi Speed School in late 1992. And in 1993, he opened up his first performance facility in Wickoff, New Jersey. At the time, he was a consultant for the New York Giants. As the business thrived, it expanded to include multiple locations, including the 2000 opening of its flagship facility in Fair Lawn, New Jersey. In 2005, Parisi Speed School began franchising to health-related business in the U.S., and by 2016, it was available in more than 90 facilities and health clubs in 31 states. He's lectured extensively and contributed written content for a number of sports and health-related organizations. This is his second appearance on the podcast. His first was episode 78 in 2020, and it followed the release of his book, Fascia Training, A Whole System Approach. He now has another book out, Fascia Training and Application, so I think this interview is perfectly timed to follow up on those discussions from a few years ago. Please welcome to the show, Bill Parisi. This podcast is also timely because Bill and I have put a collaborative project that we put together through the Fascia Training Academy on sale this week. If you head to fasciatrainingacademy.com and click on the courses tab, you'll see my thoracic outlet syndrome course. This is something that we pulled together together and really are excited about because it includes not just a collection of my presentations on the etiology of these challenges, as well as some corrective exercise that we think are helpful for people in these situations, but 
also some really impressive gross anatomy dissections so that you can really understand some of the anatomical structures that impact thoracic outlet syndrome. So again, you can head to fascia-trainingacademy.com through this Sunday at midnight to get $50 off on your order. Bill, welcome back to the show as our first ever two-time guest. My pleasure, Eric. It's an honor and a privilege to be here and uh, to come back again was was very exciting. So thanks for having me. My pleasure. It's very well deserved. And, um, you know, like, I, I can't tell you how excited I was when the book arrived. I'm going to give you a shout out for those who are watching this in, in actual video form, fashion training and application. Um, really cool follow-up to the, the first fashion book you wrote um, several years ago, which was kind of the crux of what we talked about in 2020. Um, I actually remember I was in quarantine when we actually did that interview uh, prior to the MLB postseason back in 2020. So it made made use of my 10-day uh, my spot in a hotel in New York City. And fortunately, the world's a little freer now, a little healthier. So hopefully we, uh, we come up with some equally good content. Um, yeah. But the, I think the first place to start, you know, early in the book, you write that the simplified Newtonian model of how we move and produce force in three-dimensional space is incomplete. Um, I thought that was just such a compelling statement. I mean, certainly as a guy who's, who's studied that in myself, and I know you've, you've done it to great lengths as well. Let, let's maybe expand on why this model is incomplete and what it means for people in the, the health and human performance industry. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And and going against conventional wisdom, right, about challenging the Newtonian model uh, is Newtonian model is really um, uh, a pretty big stand, right? Uh, but when you talk to people like Dr. Stephen Levin, who's an orthopedic spine surgeon who really coined biotensegrity, mm -hmm. uh, you really start to understand why. I mean, the N Newtonian model really views the body as a machine made up of individual parts uh, that function independently really of each other uh you know this model is it's based on principles of classical physics which include the laws of of motion and gravity you know the model's flawed in relation to biotensegrity which i said dr stephen levine coined by visiting the natural museum of history uh about 40 years ago in dc when he was viewing this great big dinosaur and he noticed and did the math of the uh, amount of muscle on the dinosaur's spine, didn't have enough muscle to keep its head up. And that's where the concept of biotensegrity came. I, we, we've been known about tensegrity for a long time, Buckminster Fuller, combination of compression and tension. But Dr. Levin really has, has challenged this uh, with his uh, you know, foresight of being able to see you know, this through the, the lens of, of New Newtonian laws. And this model really, the biological model of tensegrity really views the body as in, a, an interconnected network of tension and compression elements. If you ever saw a tensegrity model, it's a combination of compression and tension. Um, you know, biotensegrity is based on the principles of tensegrity, um, which is, you know, the structural principles that really suggest that strength and stability uh, of a structure really come from the balance of tensional forces within it and not just from the strength of the individual parts. So these are really important breakthroughs uh, in understanding, you know, how the body functions. And it's a combination of compression and tension, compression being our bones and our bones being pulled in, in, different, in different ways to create this, this symmetrical balance that's very energy efficient going down to the atom, you know, with, with the, you know, neutrons and electrons and protons, the elements of compression and tension all the way out to the solar system of the plants, uh, of the planets and, and the sun and how it's balanced down to gravity and ground reaction forces. So the body is no different from the smallest mechanism of living life to, to the solar system. It's this combination of compression and tension and, uh, you know, that that's where I feel we need to, you know, take take a deeper look. Yeah. And I, I think you you did a really good job illustrating it. There was there was one particular sentence, you know, I, I think it was more in the context of speaking about anatomy. And you know, we we've all gone through, you know, these these classic anatomical books where, you know, the muscles and the tendons and the bones and the ligament, they're all clearly uh, delineated. And then you you go to a gross anatomy class and you see it's nothing like that. Even you look at Gray's anatomy, you know, over a hundred years old at this point, you, you recognize that, you know, muscles, tendons, 
you know, joint capsules, they don't really have clearly separated origins and endpoints. They, they all merge together. Is, is this kind of a vital piece of, of that, um, I guess, argument in your, in your opinion? Yeah, no doubt. I mean, I think one of my colleagues and close friends now is, is obviously Tom Myers. And I love his phrase, you know, we don't have 600 plus muscles in the body. We have one muscle in 600 individual pockets, you know, so, you know, one muscle in, in 600 individual pockets of, uh, of fascia and, and really, you know, again, I'm still a big believer. You got to be strong and you, you yeah. got to do those traditional sagittal plane lifts, but it's just, it's overplayed and, you know, with some athletes and um, we, we need to really start looking at the body differently. And that's what this book is hopefully going to do. And that's why I've interviewed some really great coaches that I value and respect. And, and really it's not just my you know opinion or my approach. It's, it's collaborating. And I love collaborating with, with other experts, just like yourself. Oh, it was excellent. It's extremely well-researched and well-traveled to, to pull together a lot of wisdom from a lot of places. And I, I, I actually love the example you talked about reaction wood in trees. Um, you know, I, I thought it was a great segment so I, of the book. So I'm going to let you maybe illustrate what it is to our readers, kind of pique their interest a little bit, you know, and how does, how does this concept of reaction wood relate to, to what we see in our body's adaptation approaches? Yeah. Awesome. And I, I, I love giving stories and anecdotes. That's how people remember, right. When you, when you, when you present or you write a book and that's why our writing style and my co-writer, Jonathan Allen, who's amazing, uh, yeah, him and I, you know, just, just jammed together many, many nights and, uh, hundreds of hours, but you know, they've grown trees in greenhouses in Arizona and they grow a lot faster and they, they're, 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 you know, fed perfectly and there's a perfect amount of you know the right temperature and all these things sunlight coming in but after it gets to a certain height they fall over because there's no stress wood you know uh that's developed in, and wind creates that stress wood so you know wind is omnidirectional right uh you know weather is unpredictable so this unpredictable unpredictable uh stress that that the trees are provided through wind is similar to the body. That's why we talk a lot about the body's more like a plant than a machine. Yeah. And we we need a omnidirectional stress to create a holistic organism that is more prepared, better prepared for the unpredictable environment of life and more specifically of sport. And that's where a lot of the training today still exists from a uh, pred in, in a predictable environment. You know, yeah. we're training you know, it's predictable, we're going to do this skill, this motion, so we're going to train this way, where there's got to be things that allow us to uh, uh, take on these unpredictable environments. And now I'm kind of going down the dynamic systems theory of training and the constraints led approach and doing different things, which is highly tied to fascia. And I've been making a lot of connections, um, you know, with that, and, and, and how that approach is, is addressed. Um, but that I'll save that for another question because I know it's it's coming up. <laughs> um, you know, I, I I think you you kind of just hit on an important point that we should we should touch on before we move on is just that you know talked about the you know the nature of training is is very predictable, right? It's a very closed loop, um, and I, I think that's extra problematic nowadays when we have fewer athletes playing multiple sports you know, participating in a wide variety of activities. Like you talk often in the book about like farm strong kids that, you know, basically were exposed to a ton of different, you know, kind of occupational lifting tasks on a daily basis. Um, you know, we, we know about just what like rough housing does for kids um, at a young age, just being exposed to a wide variety of stimuli. I worry about it personally. I have, I have twin nine-year-olds and, you know, even as early as seven-year-old, we had, we had people pushing for them to get involved in, you know, travel softball before they even like knew what positions they were supposed to play and all this stuff. Um, you know, do you think that this whole concept of omnidirectional, unpredictable movements to, to benefit the fascial system is probably even more important now than it was 15 or 20 years ago? Oh, huge. Uh, you know, because, you know, kids are, are sitting around more, you know, the, the technology has has caused our kids fascia systems to be not nearly as dynamic and mobile as they they you know are when you're out there playing on the monkey bars or just, you know, climbing trees and and doing all that. And it's all fascia related, you know, because when you're a kid, you're not really 
building a lot of muscle climbing trees, right? I mean, what are you doing? You're you're just manipulating the the connective tissue system, and obviously you're building some some muscle strength by doing that. But yeah, I, th that's the magical the, the myth around that stuff. People tried to figure it out. Oh, I used to play when I was climbing trees, jumping uh, fences, and all that. Well, yeah, all those stresses on the body were were missing, and now we have to we have to fabricate that in the gym, you know, Absolutely. for these kids. And having kids come in at young ages and lifting in the sagittal plane is is just one piece. It's like yeah. one piece of the puzzle. And that's where I believe the injury rates are all time highs. You think about a lot of the pros now, you know, a lot of our professional athletes, they've been training since they were 11, 12, 13 years old. They've been around. There's been facilities around, you know, I, when I first opened my facility 35 years ago, you know, there weren't a lot of sports performance training facilities and now there's a lot. So um, I think a lot of it has to do, and I, I, I'm afraid to say I think a lot of injury rates, you know, injury rates are not lower than they were 30 years ago. They're actually higher. And I think a lot of that stuff is incubated in, in the weight room and, and yeah. it just kind of comes out, out on the field or different times, but not, not a lot of people are really making the connection. I believe there's a, yeah. there's a connection there. You know, I think what we've done um, with a lot of these, maybe I'm dropping a big metaphor here, but you know, we're, with all these sagittal plane initiatives and don't get me wrong, strength's important. We've added a lot of horsepower to the car. We've also made the guardrails a lot narrower than they used to be. You know what I mean? By by not giving them enough variability to to effectively accommodate different things. So it's it's definitely something that's concerning in the context of of long-term athletic development. So hopefully this is a, a good message. So obviously it's a baseball podcast first and foremost. So, you know, for yeah. anybody out there who's got an eight-year-old that wants to specialize, don't run the other direction. Um, right. and, and to make a case for it, let's talk about fascia um, because it's, you know, we've hinted at it right now. It's, it's this, you know, to some degree nebulous concept, you know, as a, as a construct industry wide, I think it's, it's probably because it was, you know, I think on our last podcast, I, I alluded to um, Tom Myers back in 2008 or 2009 on perform better store. I distinctly remember him saying, we know about 25% of what we need to know about the fascial system. So, you know, here we are 15 years later, we know a lot more. We still don't know everything, but I do think your book does as good a job as I've seen to at least talk about some of the key structural components of the fascial system. And, maybe just as importantly, what the functional implications are. So maybe um, speak to that a little bit. Um, you know, I, I know you talk about the four types of fascia. I'll, I'll leave the floor to you in terms of how you'd like to attack that response. Yeah, no, thank you. And I, you know, the more I talk about it, you know, you, like you, Eric, you know, you're a master of, of, you know, delivering information in such an eloquent way and, and, and so informative, but the more you talk about something, the, the more ways you, you can relate to it. Mm -hmm. And more recently, I, I, Put it in real simple terms. Fascia is made up of two, two predominantly uh, elements, right? Collagen and ground substance. Mm -hmm. and, and let's just kind of bring it down to the basic fundamentals so people can really grab it. Collagen and, and, and ground substance. So, so protein collagen, type 1 collagen, it's 90% uh, type 1 uh, protein collagen. And when you think of cement, right, you're, you're laying a, a, a patio. The collagen is the rebar. Now, let's just imagine the collagen, it's it's a rubber. It's a rubber rebar. It's not metal. It's rubber, but really thick, strong rubber rebar in that cement. And then that cement is the ground substance. The ground substance is basically a bunch of polymers. You know, they're, it's proteoglycans, glycosaminoglycans, hyaluron, um, these, these, these polymers that are very hydrophilic. Uh, they love water. Um, so you got this ground substance, which is the cement uh, of these polymers, and then you've got the collagen. Now, what happens, you, you know, you go to the construction site, they're pouring this really nice uh, viscous cement, you know, in there with rubber uh, rebar, and it's, it's smooth and you can go and put your hand in it. What happens after a day? It gets really hard. Well, we don't want that cement to get hard. So what do we got to do if we want to keep that cement you know, viscous and fl and more fluid-like. We got to add water to it. We got to stir it. Well, in the body, what happens? Our fascia becomes like cement slowly as we age or if we sit uh, uh, for long periods of time or the lack of movement, right? Or moving in the same pattern all the time causes uh, areas of your connective tissue, your fascia to become more like cement. So fascia is very viscous. Um, 
it's it's in, in the sense that it has different viscosities, right? It can it can become more viscous, less viscous, based on our movement, based on our demands, based on pressure of all these things. So to kind of you know sum it up in terms of this this system, right? There's different types of fascia. We you know we superficial fascia, deep fascia, your tendons, your ligaments. Um, you know these th this fascia comes in many different forms and one form it's simple in the terms of it wraps every cell we know that as the endomyosin you know I, I describe the cell as a water balloon and inside the water balloon is water and the mitochondria and the nucleus right and the water balloon itself is the fascia it's called the endomyosin then you get a couple million water balloons put them in another really big water balloon that's another layer of fascia called the perimyosin we all know that or you know, if you took exercise phys, you kind of understand that one. And then the entire muscle is the epi, right? Now you got everything else in this big water balloon. And all these water balloons are interconnected through this web, you know, this unique web. And then you got all these other water balloons that are trains, you know, the superficial back line that, that not necessarily, I mean, a form of a water balloon, but not necessarily the cells I, I describe as water balloons. But then you got these sheets of fascia, if you will, like a tendon, not a water balloon, but a lot of the collagen is compact a lot more tightly uh, than in than in a, you know a myosin. But so we have these different forms of fascia, uh, and they all work together, and they provide um, a, a communication network. You know, because we know fascia has eight times more the proprioceptors than muscle muscle. Um, it's, it's where the cells kind of live. You know, it's a, it's a system that uh, provides cushioning and allows, gives the cells its form. I say a lot, you know, muscles, um, fascia without muscle is pulled pork. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just, it's just this string of, of muscle tissue that has no form or chopped meat. Right. I mean, it has no form and, and fascia gives it its form. So we have these, you know, this, this cement uh, kind of thought process in terms of wet cement, in terms of what fascia is and the rebar inside. And that's exactly, I think, a great way to remember or understand it. And this stuff is what wraps the individual cell, groups of cells. It's what's packed in underneath our foot, the plantar fascia, yeah. you know, it's, it's in our lower back, the thoracolumbar fascia. So fascia is highly um, hydrophilic. It's, it's, it loves water, right? The ground substance. And it's everywhere in the body. It's the, it's the largest sensory organ in the body. Um, and it's like the oceans in the world. You know, you have the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean. You have all these lands of water. And then you have landmarks like the, the specific areas, the Gulf of Mexico, and, you know, just like the plantar fascia. So we... There's, there's a lot of ways to, to look at fascia. It does a lot of things. And I... I kind of know I I bounced around a little bit there, but hopefully that answers the, the answers the question. No, I thought it was a great answer because what it, honestly I think it did a really good job of speaking to the versatility, right? There there are different levels of density that are ideal. Um, you know, like I, I as we were going through the book, you know, you talked about the four types of fashion, and you you know you talk about superficial fashion. And it's like, all right, this is why this athlete did so well post operatively with some skin rolling, right? And you talk about visceral fascia. There, that's an entire different discipline of manual therapy that some people have thrived in, no matter how you know weird it may seem. Um, but I, I like how you spoke, to, you know, to the different types of fascia, and I and I thought it was also really valuable. You you talked a lot about viscosity just now, and you know it, it kind of leads to the discussion of non Newtonian fluids. Um, and I, I thought that was a really important. I think you talked a lot about cornstarch uh, and a pool full of it. You know, in the book. Um, because people don't realize that your fascial system can do very different things under different, you know, circumstances, different needs. Can you maybe explain to, you know, our, our listeners how these, these principles of non-Newtonian fluids work in the fascia system? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the Newtonian model really is, it's useful in some respects and inadequate in explaining the body's complexity and, and interconnectedness. Um, and, and going back to, you know, biotensegrity and, and addressing that a little bit, um, I think it's important that it relates to not just the pulling, pushing forces of the bones and the connective tissues, but the ground substance, which really, when we talk about the uh, non-Newtonial fluids in terms of how it changes mm -hmm. and how I like to describe it and the importance of these, these changes is, you know, your fascia 
It's this cement with rebar in it. And that viscosity of that cement is really important. And it can change from what I like to call extremes from, you know, hot syrup to room temperature syrup to cold syrup to creamy peanut butter to, you know, chunky pe or, or, or thicker peanut butter to peanut butter, chunky peanut butter in the refrigerator. You know, think about the different levels of the viscosity I just talked about. And based on your environment, like that ground substance, you know, that fluid within fascia, which is, again, uh, proteoglycans, uh, glycosaminoglycans, hyaluron, which is secreted based on our, our movements. Managing uh, that viscosity is very important. And we do manage it, obviously. When you warm up, you know, it's not just blood flow, but it's 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 changing that viscosity of that ground substance and creating fluid flow uh, in the system. But also at the same time, you know, manual manipulation is an important element of, of changing the viscosity uh, of ground substance. And, and I think when athletes are training, the magic is, and we're going to get into this, I know, of changing that viscosity is, you know, full length, you know, multi-joint omnidirectional movements. It really continues to come back to that, not just to create the construction workers of the fibroblast cells to lay down more collagen, but to, you know, keep mixing that cement, right? Because if you stop moving, the cement dries. You got to hydrate and you got to move and you got to move in, in big ways. And yeah. that's, that's the big take home message that we need to do more with our athletes. Yeah. And I think you, you nailed it, not just in the context of like the viscosity discussion and making sure the cement doesn't harden, but it's also because as you, you, you spoke to earlier, it's a, it's this highly proprioceptive feature of the body. Like you're not just exposing it to these, these like mechanical changes, I guess. You're also exposing it to neurological input that makes us, you know, perceive threat, you know, as less significant. When we get to extreme positions. These are the things that prepare us for the chaos that we encounter in sports and, and, and daily lives. Right. And, yeah. and I think it leads to my next question. And, and this was like probably the biggest aha moment of the book for me. And it's terrible that I, I took, you know, Two, two plus decades of a career to get to it. You talked about three types of load, tensional, compressive, and shear. And it goes without saying that everyone knows how to compress. Anybody, you know, compression is a hot topic in the strength edition field. Bill Hartman, you know, has spoken did a great job with his work. And, you know, tensional makes sense, right? We're, we're lengthening tissues, um, you know, plyometric stuff, things like that. But we fail to realize that shear is, is probably a incredibly high percentage of what we encounter in, in sporting worlds, particularly in rotational capacities, anything that involves change of direction, stuff like that. But it's it's poorly, poorly represented in the typical training programs that we write about. So what's your take on the implications of all three, tensional, compressive, and shear, and how they relate to, to building a comprehensive training program? Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, obviously you need all three and, and there's a, a real important purpose to all three. And, and again, I, I don't think we need to talk much about compressive loads. I mean, and that's what most people are doing for the for the most part. Um, but that does play an important role. Um, when you talk about tensional loads, um, you know, I think from a standpoint, when you look at your tendons and you look at your your recoil ability, there's there's a lot more research out there and what's coming out and you know in terms of that ability to uh exert force, ground reaction force. Yeah. Obviously there's a muscular component to that, especially, you know, someone that's, you know, accelerating or someone that is, you know, doing a, a vertical jump, there's a muscular component to that. But these tensional forces, we know we can get a lot of free energy from, from tendons. Mm -hmm. And if, if you understand muscle pulsing and you understand how to really co-contract to create stiffness, a lot of people think, you know, stiffness is bad. Um, you know, stiffness is one of the most important things you can generate, but you got to know how to pulse stiffness. And that, you know, to me comes from that ability to create that tensional force. And it's, it's, you know, when a, when a world-class sprinter is running a, a hundred meter dash, their foot's on the ground for eight hundredths of a second. They're generating, you know, a thousand pounds of force for a 200 pound athlete. Mm -hmm. And that force is really generated or, or coming from the tendons. I mean, obviously the leg is being whipped through from the you know glutes, hamstrings and whatnot, you know, initiating that. But when that foot strikes that ground for that eight hundredths of a second, 
a lot of that stretch is coming from the tendon giving that recoil. So we have to understand how to create and how to develop these tensile forces, you know, within the tendon in a way through a lot of different types of bouncing movements, like a lot of rudimentary jumps. So when I got into fascia, I just started doing a lot more rudimentary jumps and, you know, trampoline and all these things for the lymphatic system that we get from just bouncing. Um, you know, we do anywhere from two to four minutes of bouncing as part of our warm up. you know, just kind of bouncing. So it's a continuous uh, jumping jack kind of series. Uh, but that, I, that plays a really, really big uh, role in what we do. Shear forces, shear loads is really interesting because that's where the research is starting to come out more where, you know, the fascia sites are secreting more hyaluron with shear forces and, and large movements, you know, large full body movements. And hyaluron is going to, you know, carry up to a hundred. I think I read up to a, a thousand times its weight uh, in, in uh, bound water. And how do we facilitate more bound water to create more fluidity in our structures? So it's creating more controlled shear forces, but in a way that is not, you know, a risk, you know, to our structure. And one of the things that always comes to mind, you know, when you think about, you know, doing a movement, I, I love the Viper, right? So Michelle's uh, uh, tool, the log, you know, Michelle's story is phenomenal in terms of here's a guy training Canadian hockey athletes 20 years ago and getting them strong. And the, and the hockey coach says, uh, he goes to the hockey coach, how are my guys doing? And they say, uh, got to get them stronger around the puck. He goes six months later, gets them a lot stronger in the bench squat. How are my guys doing? Got to still get them stronger around the puck. Who's beat my guys? The farm kids, right? <laughs> so the farm boys, they're bailing hay, they're digging ditches. A lot of sheer forces going through the body, you know, yeah. doing those types of things. So, you know, rotating in a controlled fashion with an extended, uh, um, you know, log in your hand or a viper in your hand where, you know, muscles at length, but that force is traveling through your arms, through your shoulders, through your spine, through your core as you're rotating, controlled. You know, you're not going crazy out of neutral. You're not over rotating, but you're creating these sheer forces, which really facilitate the secretion of hyaluron, you know, especially through multi-joints of the body, which is going to give you this, this feeling of fluidity mm -hmm. and, you know, managing the shear. And I'm not talking about loading up a Paloff press, or I'm not talking mm -hmm. about, about going in that old style Nautilus machine where you're doing these heavy rotations of concentric and eccentric contractions. I'm talking about fluid total body movements with a controlled load that the force is transferred and transcended through the skeletal system, through multiple uh, muscular structures. Some are in isometric contraction and some are shearing all at the same time. And I don't, I'm not going to go and say this is scientifically proven, but there's something special about that type of stress on the body where you have certain muscles are in isometric, certain muscles are shearing, and it's a full body activity. Mm -hmm. Something special is going on, releasing something that's making the body feel more fluid. It makes perfect sense. And I think it also justifies why, you know, we, we've all seen it. There'll be a, an athlete who, you know, I, I can just think, I remember the first time I saw a guy with a 16 inch vertical jump who threw 95 and it made no sense to me, right? We've seen guys who are just wholly unimpressive on force plates, but then you put them into rotational patterning and something magical happens. And I'm, I'm not saying that we want that level of poor athleticism and, you know, classic bilateral, anything we, we need to train that, but there are people that can make it work just because they, they presumably are so effective, you know, in managing and, and transferring shear stress or shear force, I should say. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe, maybe this leads to the next question is, you know, a big, a big point of this book is, you know, highlighting examples of fascia aware training. Um, so, you know, you talked about everything from boxing to Proteus to the Viper, all these different implements. But if you had to take a step, you know, back, maybe take the 30,000 foot view, what are some of your key principles for fascial fitness? Um, yep. You know, do you have your head wrapped around it perfectly? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I have about you know, five things or so, like five key elements, you know, when I talk about fascia training, I, I mean, the first and foremost, whole body, you know, long chain movements, you know, uh, you know, and I, like I said before, shearing force under isometric contraction, like combining different muscles, some are isometrically contracting, some are shearing. I like that a lot. That's not the only way, but I really, I like that. Um, I think 
you know, long under load is another kind of way to think about that, you know, so holding elements out even, even for, you know, uh, an isometric and for periods of time and creating that, that stabilization. So long under load, whole body long uh, chain movements, creating that shearing uh, force with some isometrics. You know, another way to think of that is omnidirectional submaximal loading, you know, just another way to, to think through some of the principles that we're doing. And, and these are kind of, they're all related to a degree. Uh, but then the other element is, you know, pre-stretch movements, you know, like a medicine ball or rudimentary jumps, you know, that, that bouncing activity. And it doesn't have to be highly intense. It, it could be similar to jumping rope, but, but we, we do it in different forms, but we're doing it consistently for, you know, four or five, six minutes, no more than six minutes. You don't need more than six. The research says, um, you know, a few days a week and it, it's hard. And then also doing those types of things where, you know, you're, you're giving on a command where you're, you're, you're jumping, you know, on the right leg, three hops forward, two hops forward on the coach's command, where you're bringing this unpredictability into a, a movement like that. So now you're not only working on the fascia element, but now you're working on, I mean, I guess you are working on the fascia element, but now you're working on this unpredictable element as well with a very low intensity uh, type movement, uh, a very safe movement that can be done often. So, you know, I like those types of those principles. Um, I think, when you look at the different tools, like I said, I, I, a medicine ball is probably the tool that I was introduced to when I was 15 years old as a javelin thrower. And that's where all this really incubated. That's why I gravitated so much to this. And I think Robert Schleip, a top German scientist, he really, and I said it in my first book, and it's worth saying again, he did an ultrasound on Robert. Um, Robert Schleip did an ultrasound on uh, Thomas Roller's right pack. Thomas Roller won the javelin gold medal in 2016 ultrasound in the right pack, four millimeter aponeurosis across his right pack, a half a millimeter across his left pack, free energy, free rubber band, Achilles tendon that was developed across the right pack. And we want to create that internal wetsuit underneath yeah. us. And we do that through these types of things. You know, me medicine balls, we're not really building muscle when we throw a medicine. We're, we're triggering mechanical transduction within the system for the fibroblast cells that are the construction workers that go out and lay the collagen and bring in the ground substance and, you know, create new wet dynamic elastic cement that is very, it's viscous. It has viscosity, ability to change its viscosity, and it's created in ways to aid athleticism and to help, uh, you know, enhance injury resiliency. And that's the key takeaway message. I think, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that's great. There. You know, you, you also made, and this was a part where I was, I was wrestling with, you know, how to, how to take some of the key competencies from the book and implement them to our actual programming is, you know, you talk about, a, you know, a lot of this, I guess, fascial challenge, you know, that we we throw out people in training, it might take two to three days for the fascial system to recover and remodel between bouts. And certainly I know one of Tom Myers's key principles was like, be, be patient and persistent. Like these things can take 18 to 24 months to really see pronounced changes. So, no. you know, and I think we realized that there are certain athletes that, you know, they tend to be like the wide infrasternal angle, really stiff, like linebacker types. They seem to hold a charge, like almost like an electrical charge after a, a heavy strength training session. So certainly there's an individual difference where a lot of our loose joint athletes, you give them some, some good stiffness and they feel like a million bucks. Some of our other athletes might actually feel tight and unathletic. What's the best way for us to structure our training to deliver adaptation, but not leave athletes sore and stiff all the time as we're trying to maybe affect these positive changes um, with some of the principles you just outlined. We interrupt this podcast with a quick reminder that this episode is brought to you by AG1. It's an NSF certified all-in-one superfood supplement that features 75 whole food sourced ingredients designed to support your body's nutritional needs. I use this product daily myself and a ton of our athletes do as well. Head to drinkag1.com backslash Cressy and claim my special offer of 10 free travel packets with your first purchase. AG1 gives you peace of mind that you're covering all your nutritional bases. Again, that's drinkag1.com backslash Cressy, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y, and you'll get that special offer. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. It's really interesting. Um, 
you know, I think a lot, so much depends on the athletes, not only training age, but training history and what they've been doing. And I, from my good friend, Stuart McGill, what, the last thing you want to do is take a power lifter and try to make him a golfer, right? Because yeah. your, 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 your body is, is a product of its environment. And I think what we start to talk about, you know, training and, and some of these principles, we got to really understand the nature of the athlete sport, but, but also the nature of their body and their, their genetic makeup. And what are they, you know, were they born to be more of a belly dancer or a power lifter and, you know, how athletes respond to stress is different, right? Like some athletes can come and, and, and recover quickly. And so other athletes, you know, take a whole lot longer. And I think you got to coach your athletes for them to really start to be more in tune with their body so they can tell you what they're, what they're feeling. I know we talked a little bit about, I, you know, read through the, some of the questions, you know, some of the, the challenges I had with, with, you know, training, you know, my sons over the years, it's the, really trying to understand when they're, they're fully recovered from this type of training, you know? Yeah. And, and when you, when you think about some of the things, you know, to think about when, when athletes are performing quote unquote fascia training or doing these types of movements, you know, you feel really good when you're doing it. And it's not like you're gassed when you're done, you know, you're not, you know, you don't, you don't get this burn. You don't get a lot of a muscle fatigue. And if you're deconditioned, you're going to get fatigued, but if you're a well-conditioned athlete, you know um, you don't necessarily get fatigued. You'll, you'll feel it more than somebody that has been doing it for a while, but it's a tricky, it's a tricky yeah. deal to kind of really understand, you know, when you can come back and when you're fully recovered. That's why we like to stick to, to two days a week. If we're going to have a focused training session uh, from a fascia perspective, we don't, you know, we don't like to go more than two, you know, three days a week max. Uh, and that's, if it's three days a week or four days a week, that's when we incorporate the training is more part of the warm up, like the yeah. fashion element of the training is more. That's what I was going to say, is it more micro dosed on a daily basis? That's exactly right. Um, you know, and that's that's one of the things I was going to share. We definitely microdose it. And that's one of the things I made a change, you know, training my sons, you know, over the years where we would do some heavy fascia training days. And I realized, you know, even though it, it didn't seem like a lot, like we didn't use a load more than 20 pounds. Like that was the heaviest load we used. But using it in these omnidirectionals in odd positions, you know, definitely takes a toll on the structure. And I, you know, I moved to more, a little bit more of a micro dosing and, and changing the approach to, to that opposed to doing a full, you know, say 45 minute, you know, fascia training workout. And a lot of that has to do with their, their season and, mm -hmm. and what, what their needs are in terms of their specific sport, their specific needs. You know, one of my, my guys needed more pure, you know, sagittal strength. Yep. Uh, and we've been slowly gradually it, it, graduating to that because I was never worried about, you know, from a sagittal plane squat strength, that's not that hard to get. You know, right. it's not, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to get somebody strong in the squat. So I never, that was never a big emphasis of mine. We did it, but it wasn't something we trained for. We mm -hmm. did it to kind of slowly build. We were always, you know, working the fascia connective tissue system. And that's really where, you know, we have the benefit. Now that he's in college and he's out of my control, he's playing Division One football. He's going to get strong in college, you know, mm -hmm. and he's probably not going to get a whole lot of uh, fascia training, although the University of Delaware, they're doing a great job. I've done two seminars down there with them already, and uh, they've already started to incorporate some some training in, uh, down there. So, uh, Chris, the head guy down there is awesome. That's great. You know, it's, it's interesting. I think, you know, you probably, you know, you had your sons who are kind of your guinea pigs for some of this stuff. And you know, you, you nerd out in your lab, right? You come up with as much as you can. The, the thing that, uh, that was really, really compelling for me with this is um, 2020. So we had the pandemic year um, and it was an interesting time because, you know, all these major league players, small players put in a full off season of training. They left and went to spring training for three weeks. Then the world shut down. You know, a lot of them were, you know, without gym access, whatever it was. Florida was a state where I was and Florida opened back up actually relatively quickly. So a yeah. lot of the athletes were able to get back to training. They reported July 1st, um, you know, had a month of summer camp and then it was a 60 game season basically for August and September and then postseason. So what we actually found out was we had, we had athletes that were coming back basically, you know, late October, early November, 
And it was like they had never played a season. I mean, strength sticks around so easily at that level. You know, we had guys that walked back in and were trap bar deadlifting 500 for reps on the first day of the off season. And it's like, all right, guys, we got to figure something else out. And so I just had a, a collection of guys. I was like, you know what, let's, let's train other qualities. We, we've maxed out the potential here. And it was, it was not long after we had brought in Proteus. Um, we, were, we were lucky to be one of the first facilities to have one. And what we did was actually approached it much more from a force velocity standpoint was, Hey, let's throw our med balls for more of our, our speed strength work. And then we've got Proteus. We can add a little more resistance. Let's, let's train that for strength speed and, you know, kind of just shift traditional lifting down to, you know, 10% of total volume. And I'll tell you what, it was some of the best like velocity changes we've seen, but just as importantly, honestly, uh, fewer aches and pains, things like that when guys ramped up. And this was in spite of like the world was crazy back then, the number of shutdowns for COVID scares and things like that. It was a very, very smooth like spring of 21 for our guys. Um, and I look back on them like I I kind of stumbled onto a, some of these key lessons of fascia, uh, you know, aware training completely by accident. It, it was forced by a pandemic and just the circumstances, but it gave me the impetus to actually try it out. So I, I, I think you're really onto something. And so here's a, here's a, 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 maybe a cool case study for you. Let's, cause we see this all the time. Um, we get guys that go to a traditional college weight room, right? They, yeah. they put 250 pounds on their back squat. You know, they get better like crazy for the first 18 to 24 months. And they actually start to regress as juniors and seniors. Cause they're doing the same program as the 17 year old freshman. And, you know, it's starting to bang them up and all that. So let's say you have a 23 year old professional baseball player who's been a power lifter slash Olympic lifter, classic bilateral beast for the previous four to six years over high school and college strength conditioning. Where do you see the adaptations that you can chase in order to make that athlete better the fastest? How would you maybe attack that training program? Great question. Uh, first thing I would say is tissue lengthening through all planes of motion. Yep. You know, we really, you know, a, a, an athlete like that, obviously we want to, we really want to focus on tissue lengthening and, and, and really have a plan around that. Yeah. And, you know, looking at, at the athlete, you know, if they're doing that type of program, obviously uh, the odds are the mobility is not going to be yeah. where it should be. Right. Right. It's yeah. really, it's really crunched down. But um, when, when you think about the long history of, of, training and 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 the traditional concentric contractions and the eccentric contractions of just traditional isotonic training you know going and focusing more like i said before long under load omnidirectional and and for me if i was to kind of you know map out a program there's really four kind of approaches to this um or four ways of of how i like to kind of map it out and i use these different tools that i've really come to love um, you know, first, like the Viper, which is, you know, like a log. And th to me, that's the foundation, you know, the Viper movements and, and what you can do with those movements, like I said before, and going through the, the lunge matrix, you know, Todd Wright is a, you know, another guy I respect and who's really on this fascia thing. He's the vice president of performance for the LA Clippers. Um, and he's, he's come up with some great lunge matrixes and he, we, Todd and I jam at the fascia research society conventions, you know, when we go to those, it's every three years, uh, he's there, you know, we're probably the only two fitness guys, you know, traveling the world to go to these, these things. I actually was on the board of directors of that, uh, organization, organization for three years. So I kind of, I got lucky, uh, connecting with those guys, but that's the first thing I would do is really working with a, some loaded tools focusing on omnidirectional uh, movements. The next component, I, I, a tool I like to use is, is uh, a tool called the Vector, Kazon Vector. And that's a tool where it comes with a really unique strap system and it loads the athlete up uh, in a way from a lateral standpoint. And I can do a lot of different types of lung series and the, the force vectors that I'm getting pulled in. It's, it's causing me to uh, co-contract and stabilize as I'm going through these different uh, movements, lunge series, different hopping series, but the load is laterally and it, it allows me to really uh, self-organize uh, my structure, which I, has a big role, fascia has a big role in the body to self-organize and, and co-contract and create this stabilization. And like I said before, I've been doing a lot of research in Nikolai Bernstein's work uh, back in the mid 1900s, the Soviet sports scientists who really kind of pioneered dynamic systems theory and the constraints led approach yeah. and 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 really um you know experimenting with that because I believe fascia plays a big role 
uh, in in facilitating, uh, you know, quote unquote, pulsing stiffness. Yeah. And my the whole warm up that we use now and and all the things we do now is it revolves around preparing the body and practicing these these concepts of pulsing stiffness on command, you yeah. know, throughout the whole different uh, all the different movements we we do. So what I'm saying is we I go down this chain of like Viper loaded omnidirectional movements, submaximal loading movements, then we go into different types of dynamic stabilization, loading movements with a vector. Uh, then we'll, you know, medicine ball training is the next element as we will graduate. So we'll go two weeks in each of these, these tools and we'll get to learn and own the tools, yeah. meaning really own the, the implement, own the movements and, and hyper-focus on them for a couple of weeks, four sessions or so, yeah. go to the next tool, own that tool with the vector, go to the net med balls, like own that tool. And then we'll go to aqua bags mm -hmm. and you know, that will create that instability and unpredictability. So I, I have this four phase cycle with these tools and then I'll intermix them, you know, mm -hmm. with an athlete. So an athlete like that, I would, I would bring them through these cycles of these tools that all have a different kind of approach to, to quote unquote fascia training. I want them to own the techniques. I don't do a, a lot of exercises Meaning with each tool, I'll do about, you know, six to maybe 12 movements uh, with each tool. And then I kind of graduate through yeah. and, um, you know, then incorporate, you know, that tool maybe in the warm up or micro dose it. Or there might be a day where we're going to hit fascia completely and we'll go through two or three of the tools after we gave them a baseline. Because we still got to get our fundamental training in, right? We yeah. still got to do our sprinting. We, we're still going to do lifting. We're still going to do all of our other things, but we got to fit it in. And I like to fit it in, in in that format. So when someone's new to this, I like to bring in the tool. I like to have them own the tool for a couple of weeks and we'll go to the next tool, the next, the next. And now we got a command on all the tools and then we'll start bringing in and microdosing the tools uh, based okay. on the day or make it a faster training day. I hope that was clear to- oh, I love it. And, it. and I think it gives novelty to the athletes too. You know, it's not just one, oh, board, big one time. dry erase board. You can, you can intermingle once you, once you know the rules, you know how to break the rules, right? Like that's, that's, that, that's a key that's part it. of it. Um, and, and that's, that's a good point. Like keeping the athletes interested yeah. with the tools. And I found that to be huge, you know, especially my population, you know, a big part of my population are, are, are kids, you know, young yeah. athletes, you know, high school kids, uh, younger kids. So that's where I live. And uh, that's, that's been great. Yeah. I think that's, that's huge. You know, you, you hinted at my next question a few minutes ago when you talked about Dr. McGill saying, don't, don't try to turn a power lifter into a golfer. Um, and I, I think you, you talk a lot about, and, and I'm, I'm kind of mindful of this. I'm a, I'm like a wide infrasternal angle guy who lifted a lot of heavy stuff for a long time. I was a pretty good tennis player growing up and someday I'm going to get back to playing tennis. And like probably most 42 year old guys who are thinking about that, like, I don't want to leave an Achilles on the court. Um, and, you know, you talk a lot about the importance of vector variation as a means of improving fascial fitness. This, this definitely makes sense, but where are some instances where we as, you know, strength and addition professional rehab specialists, whoever we are, need to proceed cautiously, you know, with how we implement vector variation? Yeah, it's a great, great question. And I think, you know, it's, it's funny because uh, Bobby Stroops was one of the uh, coaches I interviewed, you know, he's the trainer to Patrick Mahomes since he was nine years old. And uh, he was telling me how some other quarterbacks would want to come and, and train with Patrick and like, they just, their fascia systems couldn't handle it. They just, yeah. you know, they just don't have that, that malleable, that, you know, yeah. fascia that, that has been trained like that. So, you know, again, if, if you're a power lifter most of your life, that annulus fibrosis is, is pretty locked down, you know, yeah. that, that connective tissue around the spine, it's more like a log yeah. uh, and, and to change that's going to take a lot of time. So yeah. that's kind of the approach where if you've been, you know, lifting in the sagittal plane a long time, you just can't go out there and start doing 10 tons of medicine balls yeah. and, and, and start throwing and, and, and doing all this volume, you're going to get hurt. And that was yeah. the fear of some of those guys or, you know, those quarterbacks, like you just can't, you can't do these things. So you have to really graduate into it, uh, you know, gradually add these elements. That's why I like to add like the Viper tool. And I do that for a little bit and, and slowly bring it in. But I think you got to proceed with caution. Um, I think you can start slow. Uh, you, you know, you have to bring, you have to bring this type of training in because I think you're just going down. If you continue to do what you're doing and, and you want a different result, you know, that's insanity. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but incorporating, you know, the omnidirectional, uh, um, 
skill set or, or, or motion in, into a routine, it's kind of like, you know, five, 10 minutes in the beginning and gradually increasing that over time. It doesn't have to be a lot. You don't have to do this big whole workout just a little bit, but understand it's going to take, it's going to take multiple months to start to even feel a little bit different. Um, I, I think after a couple of weeks, you'll feel a little different, but to really see drastic change, it's going to, it's going to take some time yeah. and it doesn't, it doesn't happen quickly, but you know, it, so many people do need it. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, sometimes the best way to get out of a hole is to stop digging. I think a lot of people want to add this, but they don't realize that, you know, the four days a week of, of conventional bilateral heavy loading is, is probably what's you know, they're, they're basically just bailing water on the boat while it's continuing to, to fill up. So, you know, I, I think what a lot of people really lose sight of is the fact that maximal strength is actually really easy to maintain. You go in and hit two sets of four on a, on a deadlift every four to five weeks, and it's going to stick around. It's just going to be there when you go back to it. Some of these other qualities go away really quickly, not just you know, some of the fascial fitness concepts you, you talk about, you know, anybody who's ever sat in a car for a 12 hour ride knows how they feel when they get out. But, you know, I think power tends to detrain quickly speed, you know, will fall off every, you know, five to seven days if you don't train it. So I, I think there's just something you said about being consistent and continuing to show up, but also not, you know, digging the hole any deeper while you're going through it. You know, that's a huge point. You said, you know, maintaining strength is, is not nearly as difficult as, is maintaining speed and, and maintaining that fascia fluidity because, you know, you got those fibroblast cells just locking you down yep. with, with, with collagen. And if you're not moving correctly or doing these types of things, you're going to create inhibitions in, you know, in your movement and, and, you know, just doing the same things of sagittal plane lifting, you're adding to those inhibitions and limiting your fluidity as an athlete and increasing your risk of injury. And, you know, look at all these injuries that are happening with our, our pro pro uh, athletes today. And I, a lot of it's, you know, comes down to overuse and just, you know, not recovering. Right. I mean, why else? I mean, this injuries happen obviously with, you know, collisions, um, contact injuries. I'm not talking about those, but non-contact injuries. I, I, I don't see it being that complicated. I really don't, you yeah. know? It's, I mean, the sports are, are played at all time high speeds for sure, but maybe it speaks back to like the, the horsepower with, with narrower guardrails than ever before. Um, That's exactly right. Let, let's go lightning round. Um, always, a, always a fun way to cap these off. And I asked you this question uh, almost four years ago on our last one. So I'm actually curious what the updated answer is. What do we still need to investigate about the fascia system? Yeah, no, it's it's great. I think it's a great question. Uh, you know what? You know, going outside the athletic realm, uh, it's relation to different diseases, and, mm -hmm. and and you know, the fascia is a huge communication system. It's it transports uh, you know elements in and out of the cells. It has so many different uh, areas of of conduction that it it, it provides, and there's so much so so much to learn. Um, I think, you know, the work of Robert Schleip and the Stuckos from Italy, uh, Jan uh, Winky from Australia, these, these experts are really doing deeper dives into this. And I think that's, that's, there's breakthroughs coming through, uh, uh, coming out. I, I will, uh, I won't be surprised if you are going to hear more and more about the fascia system. There was a big article in New York times about six months ago. I don't know if you saw that, uh, that came out, talked about it. Uh, but yeah, I think in relation to the disease, there's a lot to learn. I think it's it's communication capabilities yep. uh, in terms of not just from a from a, a neural standpoint, but just cellular signaling standpoint. Uh, there's more and more that's coming out around the fascia where we just thought it was this innate packing material for so long. It was like the stuff you get in the uh, Amazon box, you know, the popcorn or the bubble wrap. You know, that's what that's what you know anatomists and doctors thought for the longest time up until you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, that's not a lot of time, you know, you know, that, that, that we, we made this major change. Um, and, but, but in, in, in relation to our in industry, it's true impact on injury resiliency, yeah. it's truly, truly understanding and getting, and we're getting close. Jan Winky did a study, a meta-analysis uh, a couple of years ago, uh, showing that over 85% of all soft tissue injuries are in the collagenous tissue uh, or the collagenous tissue is part uh, uh, has been a part of that of that muscle injury. And when you think think about the fascia, the connective tissue, the endo, the epi, and more specifically, it was the uh, it was the perimyosin, 
where a lot of this breakdown uh, has occurred in, in some of the research he's done. And Eric Owens, who has a technique called uh, the Delos technique, he's a massage therapist. He has really done a deep dive in this area, and I think he's on to something. Um, his interesting story, his dad was a massage therapist. He was actually an engineer by trade, got a bum shoulder. He lived in Houston, Texas in the 90s. No one can help him out. So he went to massage school to, school to figure it out. And he was like working on his own myofascial release in the late 80s. And before you know it, he quit his uh, his uh, engineering job. And now his clients in the 90s were Warren Moon, Havelander, Havelander Holyfield, Carl Lewis, you know, that was doing myofascial release of those guys in the early 90s. Eric was only like seven or eight at the time. Now he's a very successful uh, professional, owns like eight massage clinics in Chicago. And uh, one of my go-to guys, he's in the book. And the point I'm saying is that when I'm bringing this up, he, he has a unique technique uh, from a massage standpoint, utilizing oscillating angular pressure to hit the perimyosin that he believes becomes fibrotic. So the shearing force of ART or Graston, you know, the muscles we think about sticking together, uh, not being able to glide. Well, deep within the structure of the muscle cell itself, he believes his concept is that perimyosin becomes fibrotic. And the only way you can release that is through angular oscillating pressure. And it has to be oscillating and angular for a couple of reasons, oscillating so the body doesn't guard. Because if you go deep in someone, the, you know, the muscle we're going to guard and we're going to contract. Mm -hmm. So he's got guys like Robert Schleip on his team that are all in with him. Mm -hmm. Like the top scientists that he went out there and got vetted. Uh, and I share that with you because, you know, the initial question was, what's next? I think these are the concept concepts. What I'm sharing, I think, is what's next. Yeah. I think what's next is really understanding vibration guns and massage and really what you need to do and what are you doing to the tissue? What's mm -hmm. happening and what kind of changes are we truly affecting? I think that's a big what's next. I think somebody like Eric is on it. That's why I included him in the book. And it's not because it's Eric. It's because of his history, his yeah. father's story, him. And now he's got the top scientist on board, like helping him share yeah. the message. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's amazing that there's still people out there who are who are fighting the, you know, the utility of manual therapy. I mean, it's, it's been on cave paintings for 4,000 plus years. Like there's a reason it's stuck around. There's, there's the juice is worth the squeeze. It's just right yeah. now we're elucidating what actually is the, the rationale that it's working for people. Um, yeah. So uh, second question, you spoke at length about how a lot of the principles in this book were based on, you know, your, your sons being your athletic guinea pigs, which I thought was awesome because I have nine-year-old twin daughters and I'm, I'm kind of like waiting for the day when they're ready for it. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm curious, what did you try that did not work out? What lessons did you learn along the way? Yeah. Well, I mean, I never was one, like I was never big, um, I mean, Lifting's important and, you know, we lifted, but we never made it the, the most important thing. And I would say, you know, I probably could have in some ways, maybe believe it or not, lifted them a little bit more. And that's, that's kind of crazy to say, but I was more on that conservative side. Um, but like looking back, I would say at this point though, and I kind of oscillate back and forth with that, with that answer, because I know we can always build strength. Yeah. You know, I'm, and I know strength is coming. It. Even, even, yeah, I got a one son. He's a college basketball player, and mm -hmm. you know, he's 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 solid with it, with his strength. My other son, you know, is a receiver in college now, playing football, and uh, he can definitely get stronger. So I kind of always go back and forth, but I know now in college, I, I know he he will he will get stronger. I, the, the second thing I would say is when I got into the whole fashion thing, which about seven eight years ago, which was really good timing in terms of their ages. Um, I probably went maybe a little bit too much with it too soon, you know, where not that they got injured. I mean, we had our tweaks and, you know, my younger guy. Yeah. I mean, he might've tweaked up a few times, but probably too much too soon. I mean, like what you would expect, right. Yeah. That's why I'm in this podcast. And that's why you <laughs> asked the question, yeah. you know, and I learned, learned it. It was all really new to me. And I'm like, Oh, like anybody else. And I did it as a javelin thrower. So what's really mm -hmm. unique with me I just got it right by accident. You know, I was just doing this stuff in the 80s. Yeah. As, as a 19 and 20 year old in the 80s, I was doing all this stuff and I didn't know why, mm -hmm. but now I know. And I, I don't, you know, 
I kind of forgot that I was doing 10,000 medicine ball throws in a winter, mm -hmm. you know, that doesn't mean I can have my, my 16 year old son do 10,000 medicine balls. Like I, you know, I kind of had to yeah. grow into that. So that was probably something just don't, don't go a whole, don't go full steam ahead with this thing yeah. quickly like feel, that. Feel it out. <laughs> Big thing. Yeah. Nice. And last but certainly not least, what's next for Bill Parisi and the Fascia Training Academy? Yeah, it, it's a great question. Um, we aligned with a group called Alliance Orthopedics. And I, we hit the jackpot with this group. Um, they're a medical group, uh, about 20 uh, uh, doctors. Uh, the founder is an incredible guy, uh, Nick Bafano. Uh, he's a former Wall Street guy that got in a really bad car accident, had horrible experience with his surgery and his therapies, decided to open up his own medical practice and partner with docs. And he's like just off the cuff. The guy's in Tony Robbins is round circle. He's in the Tony mm -hmm. Robbins mastermind, you know, so he's, he's dropping 300 a grand a year on Tony Robbins. I mean, the guy's all about just being great. So any piece of equipment we got, we got highly advanced ultrasound machines in our place. Now we got a medical doctor there. So really we've catapulted to a whole mm -hmm. nother level, which accelerated my excitement. So mm -hmm. really to start doing some research, ultrasound, looking at fascia, yeah. with a group of 15 athletes because we have a uh, an eighth grade full full blown eighth grade school we have kids that come to uh school with us full time in our building mm -hmm. and to start doing some fascia related research with ultrasound looking at fascia thickness looking at these kids eight months 12 months later 24 months later looking what kind of change we can make mm -hmm. and you know doing it with a group like this with these That's medical good. professionals we were lucky to have a guy like dr mark harrington who's whose job with the Cleveland Browns, Nick hired him away. Now he's with us. And his specialty was ultrasound reading, yeah. uh, you know, diagnosing injuries through ultrasound. So, you know, just, just to answer the question is, it's pushing the research forward yeah. and really coming to the table with re really sound information that we can share and, and, and mo validate more of what I'm, what I've been sharing. What That's been awesome. Well, this is, this is tremendous. I'm going to give it another shout out. The book is incredible. Fascia training and application. Um, I told him off air, but I am not one to sit down and read a book all the way through. And I want to say I, I crushed like 150 pages in one sitting at one point in this, just because it's, um, it's, it's incredibly well written, not just in the context of the information, but also the way it's related. It's, it's, it's infotainment, which I think is really important. So um, highly recommend people check it out. Uh, they can find you on Instagram. It's uh, Bill underscore Parisi. And yep. then the Fascia Training Academy is FasciaTrainingAcademy.com, correct? Yep, that's correct. And we have awesome. a big event coming up. Um, yep. You know, all the uh, contributors of the book are going to be speaking here in New Jersey. Awesome. We're partnering with Perform Better on it. Awesome. So a live event. So that's going to be great. And it's going to bring the book to life because we're going to have all the speakers come and present, but re really appreciate Eric, you uh, having me on, uh, you know, for a second time. It's, it's a true honor. Uh, my pleasure. Bringing a lot of great information to the forefront. We appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much, my friend. Thanks so much for tuning in to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. We really appreciate you carving out some time in your schedule to listen, not just to this episode, but also to some of the episodes from our archives. If you enjoy what you heard, we'd love it if you'd share it with friends, colleagues, and teammates, as well as leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Thanks again for your time.